Thank you. This is quite the honor. So I've dedicated most of my career to helping improve the ways in which we manage uh, the environmental impacts of energy supply and use. And I think one of the attributes of an exciting career is to be in a field that is at a point of transition when you're active. And that's where we are today. So I want to tell some of that story. And so again, you know, how are the ways in which we supply and use energy changing? What does that mean for the ways in which we manage environmental impacts of that? Well, I want to identify a few challenges, draw a few lessons, and conclude with a few opportunities. And if I can jump to those opportunities, the message here is that there's a space for everybody. In fact, we need all of you. So for those of you who follow in, in, um, issues at the intersection of energy and environment, you'll know that many of our most significant environmental problems relate in some way to the ways in which we supply and use energy. For instance, over half of our emissions of greenhouse gases are directly related to fossil fuel combustion, as are emissions of pollutants that lead to smog and acid rain. Moving beyond air, um, roughly two-fifths of our water consumption is directly related to energy production. So while clean air, drinkable water, healthy ecosystems, and a stable climate are important to our health and well-being, so is access to affordable and cheap energy. So it's really remarkable when you look back over the last 45 years, really since the dawn of the modern environmental movement, and realize that many of the big problems we were concerned with at the time are no longer big visible problems today. In fact, it's even more remarkable when you think about what's happened over that time, when you realize how much our economy's grown, how much more we drive and consume energy, how much our population's grown, and you look at that and you realize that we've been able to bring down air emissions, a measure of pollutant, pollution, by over two-thirds on an absolute basis. And that's a rather remarkable achievement. So going forward, um, obviously we need to sustain those gains. Now if you look at how we've achieved those successes, we've relied on a fairly narrow set of technical strategies. Um, things like scrubbers on uh, power plant flue gas stacks that mitigate situations like this. We've also phased out lead and gasoline. Again, these are very successful strategies, but they focus on one problem at a time, and they also tend to be you know, sort of technology fixes. So not that they're cheap or easy, but again, you know, they're identifiable up, up front. So what I want to argue, though, is going forward as we confront the challenges that we face in the rest of the century, that these strategies will still be necessary, but they're not going to be sufficient. So what are some of those challenges? Well, it boils down to this. How are we going to meet the energy needs of, vastly, or of a growing global population at, during a time of rapid urbanization? And also, when people will be aspiring to the uh, livelihood to come with higher incomes, all at a time when we also need to be making deep greenhouse, or cuts in greenhouse gases to deal with climate change. In fact, if you just look at projections for increases in consumption of electricity, for instance, and you realize that in countries like China, demand for mobility is going to increase by orders of magnitude, it's going to be hard to avoid situations like this, which is what we see in Beijing today. In fact, we'll, be need, we'll need to supply, all other things being equal, a great deal of effectively emissions-free, pollutant-free energy just to deal with these drivers. So OK, you say, well, if we could just start where we are today, we know that we have the system we have, just figure out what we need to do to move it forward to a more sustainable state. Well, that would be easy if we thought the future was going to look like it does today. But it turns out that the energy system itself is changing rapidly. And this is sort of challenge number two. You know, the world doesn't look like it did in 1900, but if you were to go back to that time and look, say, inside a coal plant, or under the hood of an automobile, or even a lighting fixture, they would, really, they would seem familiar to what we have today. But now we're at a time of very rapid transition um, you know, across the energy system. We're moving from big centralized systems, big power plants, big refineries um, that produce gasoline and diesel energy, or um, electricity, the, the energy resources that we're used to using, um, to uh, systems that operate across a variety of scales, from big and centralized to distributed and decentralized. And we're going to be seeing a greater variety of types of energy, energy resources being used. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means a number of things. The existing uh, strategies that we've developed for managing environmental impacts of energy use may or may not be adequate. 
the energy system itself is going to be interacting with other systems. And we've seen this, for instance, with what, what biofuels has done by coupling energy and agriculture. Um, and we're going to have many you know, new stakeholders who have never been involved with energy production before entering the picture. Um, so just to give a couple of examples of what that future may look like, and this could be a whole series of TED Talks. Um, and I'm just, I have a, just a few minutes to hit a couple of examples here. Um, it's likely that in transportation, we'll be moving beyond uh, conventional gasoline and diesel that come from petroleum to a greater use of renewable fuels. More electricity, which is what we're seeing now, but possibly renewable liquid fuels. Um, some of those may come from uh, you know, crops like corn, which we use to produce ethanol today. But you may also see, for instance, greater use of switchgrass, which is what's growing on the left here. Uh, so now we have an energy resource that's not coming out of the ground, like petroleum does, but is growing on the surface of the ground and is subject to uh, vagaries of climate, impact a drought, and may also be competing with uh, you know, agricultural commodities, food production, for land use. And likewise, we may not be converting that to a fuel in a big refinery, but we may be doing it on site using what you see here, which is a mobile pyrolysis device that turns that, um, feed, that uh, switchgrass into a bio crude that can be turned into a gasoline, a synthetic gasoline or diesel later on. Well, what have you done? You've now taken the chemical engineering, chemical engineering process and you've moved it onto a farm field. You know, very different environmental impacts, very different way of managing ener energy supply. To take a, a different example, a cuter one perhaps, autonomous or driverless vehicles, not, not quite on the road yet, although they may be out there, we don't know all the time. But what would they mean for energy use? Well, the vehicles are likely to be more efficient, um, but it's, and they'll certainly improve the way the transportation system itself operates, we'll have less congestion, therefore use less fuel. Um, but with less congestion, you know, what might happen there? Well, if people don't have to worry about driving, they don't have to worry about being stuck in traffic, they may be willing to tolerate longer commutes. So maybe, you know, commuting or driving increases. And with that, in turn, sprawl perhaps, uh, which has greater impacts on land use and ecosystems. So, okay, so energy system of the future is not gonna look like it does today, but can't we just predict, you know, some of these technology changes? And importantly, you figure out what we need to do um, to manage the sort of unintended consequences of those technologies? Well, this is where, you know, a few stories, um, you know, help illustrate why that's a challenge. Um, and in fact, you know, history tells us that not only will the future not look like the past, but the future probably won't look like what we expect it to look like. So let's stay with vehicles. Um, and in fact, I want to talk about electric vehicles. Um, and not this electric vehicle, but that electric vehicle. So go back to 1900. Um, we were there a couple of minutes ago. Um, if you were around at the time, you would be justified in thinking that electric cars were the vehicle of the future. Surprise? Well, at the time, electric cars had about a 40% market share. Gasoline vehicles had less than a 20% market share. Battery technology was improving rapidly, and people, uh, no less than Thomas Edison, were making big uh, and optimistic statements about future improvements in batteries. Gasoline cars, meanwhile, were dirty, smelly, although maybe not as smelly as the horses that were still around at that time, and very difficult to start. So what happened? Well, in 1912, electric vehicles hit a peak of roughly um, 30,000 cars on the road. They hit their next historical peak of 50,000 vehicles in 2011. Why? Well, a number of reasons, but a couple of them stand out. Um, for one thing, you had a very uh, sort of a, a minor technology advancement, the development of electric starters for gasoline cars that took, it made what it was a difficult crank starting process that was, again, kind of dangerous. You could get hurt doing it. It was dirty and undignified as well and made it easy. But the other uh, uh, factor that drove electric cars off the road um, was more of a business strategy and what in retrospect looks like a bad business decision on the part of the dominant electric vehicle manufacturer to focus not on the mass market, but to focus on higher end consumers as well as fleet vehicles like taxi cabs. Of course, Henry Ford had a different strategy. So, it, you know, what looks like an obvious technology, we'll be driving electric cars in the future, doesn't always turn out to be that way for reasons that are difficult to predict. And they don't just relate to technology innovation. They re, um, much, have as much to do with business strategy, consumer acceptance, and other factors that themselves are as difficult to predict as, again, technical innovation is. So, which is not to say we should count Elon Musk out. 
Okay, so technology itself isn't easy to predict, but maybe the environmental consequences of technology change are something we can anticipate. Well, still in the early 1900s, our electric vehicle driver comes home, and this is at a time when most cities have completed, but most major cities have completed their water supply infrastructure. So what does that mean? Well, it means you have indoor plumbing and you no, you no longer have what you see here. But at the time that indoor plumbing ended where the plumbing had traditionally ended, which was in the backyard and usually in a privy uh, vault or a cesspool. And it didn't take long for the powers that be in most cities uh, to listen to the leaders of the sanitary reform movement and to begin to install sewer systems. Okay, so uh, where those sewer systems end? Well, now the plumbing of this whole system ends in the local water body, which is usually a river, which is usually upstream from the next city's water intake. So what have our electric vehicle drivers' ta tax dollars done? They've taken a waste or land use problem and turned it into a water quality problem. And the history of environmental management is actually full of examples like that, where we've simply displaced a problem or a pollutant from one uh, part of the environment into another. And when you treat air problems strictly as air problems, or sorry, waste problems strictly as waste problems, or land use problems strictly as land use problems, that's pretty much what you expect. Now, there are a number of other reasons, too, why cities didn't install wastewater treatment plants right away. Um, partly it was a political decision. You know, why, after all, do you want to spend constituent tax dollars on something that's not going to benefit your constituents? Sound familiar? And it was also had to do with our understanding of the causes of disease, as well as the ability of water to treat pollutants. But again, you know, what looked like a good thing, and that's sort of the lesson of the story, had unintended consequences for a variety of reasons that are hard to anticipate and predict. Okay, so we can't predict, of course, the technology change. We can't always, you know, anticipate surprises. But maybe we can think about larger trends. Well, let's move ahead a few decades. In fact, a little bit more than a half century. So now we're in the early 1970s. Maybe not your favorite decade, but bear with me for a minute. So, standing in the early 1970s, and if we were to look at, say, U.S. energy consumption over the past several decades, um, we would see that it increased pretty much linearly with population growth and the economy. And you'd be forgiven for, or you'd excuse somebody for taking out a ruler and simply extending that uh, trend out into the future, which is what a lot of people did. And at the time, the environmental community, people who were concerned with resource consumption were looking at those projections as well as their own, and they said, oh my gosh, we're going to run out of energy by the turn of the century, or we're going to be buried under the environmental impacts of our energy supply and use. Did that happen? No, of course not. So what did happen? Well, the major cause of what, what you see uh, was were the environmental or the energy shocks of the 1970s, starting with the 1973 uh, OPEC oil embargo, which, although not immediately, led to a lot of policy and technical innovation that, in the end, greatly improved the energy efficiency of our economy. So energy use has increased since that time, but not at nearly as fast of a rate. Okay, so we can't predict technology, can't even anticipate its environmental consequences, and even these big trends are hard to predict. Now, the lesson here, though, is that you know, our, our assumptions about the future matter, but those assumptions aren't fixed, and they can depend on things like geopolitical shocks that are entirely impossible to predict. Okay, now, if you want to know more about how to predict the future and, and, and you know, ways of improving our crystal ball, you know, Google adaptive management, Google scenario analysis, Google decision making under uncertainty. There are a lot of ways of dealing with some of the things I've been talking about here, some of these challenges. Um, and they're all interesting and the subject of a lot of research um, by my colleagues here at Duke and myself. But what I want to talk about and what I want to wrap up with are a couple of opportunities in keeping with the spirit of what we're doing here today. Um, and the first of these opportunities um, is simply this. You know, energy is for everyone. We tend to think about energy being the domain of engineers, of scientists, of economists, maybe lawyers. But really, energy needs people who understand behavior, who understand culture. In fact, I heard a, a, uh, on this campus, or actually it was West Campus, but here at Duke, earlier this month, an oilman from Texas, from Texas say what energy really needs is more cultural anthropologists. I didn't know we had any, but we need more. We need more people like that who can think broadly. We need more historians or people, I guess, like me who have a historical bent. But what we really need are people who can make the connections, who can talk to diverse groups and, again, help them communicate to see some of these larger system effects that emerge. 
um, and that we may not be able to see unless we have those people making connections. This is why I try to tell my students um, in the Nicholas School, where I teach, um, you know, that, again, we need these broad thinkers. You know, they may be disciplinary experts, but again, people who can see that big picture. So the second opportunity that I want to bring up here and leave you with um, is that energy and the challenges we face going forward in this next era of environmental management as it relates to energy are really design challenges. We've, again, we've moved from what have been very effective, very effective use of you know, sort of single technology approaches to controlling pollution or dealing with problems to a point now where we need to think broader. We need to look at that entire system. And again, that is a design uh, challenge. Um, and ask questions related to that. Um, so what do I mean? Well, we're thinking about system design in keeping with, I guess, what's been a vehicle theme here. We can ask questions like, well, to what extent will the next generation of hyper-efficient and somewhat cool-looking vehicles help us reduce our transportation energy needs while still meeting demand and our desire for mobility? You know, and then to what degree do we need to be thinking about urban planning strategies like transit-oriented development, or smart growth, or compact development to get us there. Again, these are system design questions that we need to be asking. These are as relevant today to thinking about how we manage the environmental impacts of energy supply and use as were the more focused technology solutions of the past several decades. So I want to leave you with those thoughts. And again, you know, reiterate the fact that if you're interested in energy, you know, we need you. So, thank you. <laughs>